Thank you. Good evening. Welcome to Beaumont City Council regular council meeting for Tuesday, June 25th, 2024. Here at 6 p.m. I'll call the meeting to order and we'll begin the meeting as we always do with our land acknowledgement. The City of Beaumont respects the history, languages, and cultures of all First Peoples of this land, whether it be a First Nation, Métis, or Inuit descent, and appreciates that their presence continues to enrich vibrant communities across the land. As we gather here in Treaty 6 territory in the homeland of the Métis Nation, we acknowledge that we are all treaty people and have ongoing responsibilities to protect and honor the treaty, the inherent rights of the people, and the land. Before we begin with the adoption of the agenda, I'll let people know that Councilor Markov Swain uh, is joining us remotely by Zoom, and he'll be joining us as he needs to as the meeting goes on. So next on the agenda is the adoption of the agenda. Madam Clerk, any changes to the agenda this evening? Thank you, Mayor. Administration does not have any changes to the agenda this evening. Thank you. Is there a member of council willing to move the adoption of the agenda as circulated? Councillor Barnhart. It'll thank be on the screen you, for you momentarily. There it is. Uh, thank you. I move that the June 25th, 2024 council agenda be adopted as presented. Thank you, Councillor. Discussion on the motion? Seeing none, Council, I'll ask you to vote on the motion to adopt the agenda. Councillor Markov Swain, how do you vote? I can't hear you now, Sam, for some reason. You want to give me a thumbs up on the screen? No, good enough for now. We'll get your sound back quick as we can. That carries unanimously. Thank you, Council. Next on our agenda is the consent agenda. Madam Clerk, would you put the consent agenda on the screen, please? And would you please read the consent agenda? And then we'll ask any members of Council questions on the consent agenda. Madam Clerk. Thank you, Mayor. I just wanted to point out that we uh, skipped over number three, open forum, but we do not have any open forum presentations this evening. Thank you for clarifying that. I thought, yeah, I should have just said that. Sorry. Thank you. All right. For the consent agenda this evening, the council consent to approve the following agenda items without debate. The 5.1 regular council meeting minutes of June 11th, 2024. The council accept the minutes of the June 11th, 2024 regular council meeting as presented. 5.2 special council meeting minutes. That council accept the minutes of the June 18th, 2024 special council meeting as presented. 6.4 protective services council policies. That council policy C53 levels of service policy for municipal enforcement and council policy C50 four levels of service policy for fire services as set out in attachment one and two of the June 25th, 2024 report be approved. Item 7.1, bylaw 1056-24, responsible pet ownership bylaw, first, second, and third reading. That bylaw 1056-24, 2024 responsible pet ownership bylaw, a bylaw to repeal and replace the animal control bylaw be given first reading. That bylaw 1056-24 be given second reading. That bylaw 1056-24 be considered for third reading. And that bylaw 1056-24 be given third reading. And item 12.1, the regional initiatives update. The council accept the June 25th, 2024 report, regional initiatives update as information, and that the report remain confidential pursuant to section 21 and 24 of the Freedom of Inf Information and Protection of Privacy Act. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Clerk. That's quite a mouthful. I appreciate that. Members of council, questions on the motion for the consent agenda. Councillor Penrod, you have the floor. Thank you, Mayor Daniluk. Um, I'd like to remove item 7.1 from the consent agenda, please. Thank you. 7.1 will be taken off the consent agenda. Are there any additional concerns on the consent agenda of many members of council? Sam, you're good. Thank you. All right, with that, council, I'll ask you to vote on the consent agenda as amended with 7.1 taken off. Councilor Markov Swain, how do you vote? In favor. Thank you. I can hear you now. Thank you. And that carries unanimously, Council. Thank you. All right. Next on our agenda is item 6.1 Options for an Affordable Housing Development in Beaumont. Ms. Tarnowski, I believe you're presenting. Let me find a mic for you there. Your microphone is on. 
All right, thank you very much. Good evening, Mayor Daniluk, members of council. I'm Katrina Tarnowski with Long Range Planning, and this evening I will be presenting on options for an affordable housing development in Beaumont. In December, council made a motion that administration prepare a report, including potential options, costs, locations, and other considerations for establishing an affordable housing facility in Beaumont, similar to the Gates Landing housing complex in the city of Leduc. So Gates Landing is a housing development led by the Leduc Regional Housing Foundation. It's been built in two phases with 14 one bedroom suites and two main floor commercial units constructed in 2015. And now an additional 24 one bedroom suites coming online this year. Rents in the two buildings are set at 15 to 20% below the medium market rate. Um, the project was built on a 0 0.23 hectare or 0.57 acre site and is a three-story development. Capital costs for the project totaled 8.6 million with stacked funding from the Federal Rapid Housing Initiative, the Alberta Affordable Housing Partnership Program, municipal requisitions and the contributions from the Leduc Regional Housing Foundation itself. Administration met with leadership at the foundation to talk about the potential for a similar project in Beaumont. An interest in developing a new affordable housing project in this city exists, but the foundation recommends that the city of Beaumont acts as landowner and developer for a couple of reasons. The foundation currently doesn't have the capital means to develop a new project themselves, and they were recently successful for both provincial and federal funding and may not be immediately prioritized again in grant cycles. So what would developing housing look like for the city of Beaumont? Developers are just one role within the development process for residential properties. Other rules, uh, roles include that of regulator, property manager, construction, design, financing, and consulting expertise. Beaumont would need to be both developer and regulator in which capacity we usually act while the Leduc Regional Housing Foundation would take on the role of property manager once the project was constructed. Development of multi-unit buildings requires a commitment of three to five years and includes the following responsibilities. Identifying and securing a site for development, developing the project concept, um, assessing feasibility of the project, securing financing, including grants, loans, and other subsidies, hiring professional services and overseeing the construction management process, and then coordinating transition of site operations to uh, the Leduc Regional Housing Foundation. Um, administration does not have significant experience in real estate development and would need to acquire professional consulting services to support the project. Should we decide to proceed with an affordable housing project along the Gates Landing model, administration could look at two options. Um, so developing a housing project on lands already owned by the city or purchasing suitable privately owned land for affordable housing development. Additionally, there are a few assumptions that would underlie a possible future development project. So according to the Leduc Regional Housing Foundation's 2023 housing needs assessment, single female seniors and lone parents who rent are the groups in Beaumont who are most vulnerable to core housing need now and into the next 10 years. Um, for this group, one and two bedroom units best address their needs. Um, regarding the scale of development, at least 35 to 37 units are needed to take advantage of economies of scale, and a parcel of about 0 0.2 hectares or greater is needed to accommodate that number. Um, capital costs of the development will include hard costs such as construction and landscaping, and soft costs such as consultants, preliminary studies, land purchase, and legal fees. Operational costs would further uh, impact the feasibility of the project, but these haven't been calculated at this early stage. So the costs you'll see on the following slides were calculated using the Rural Development Network's step-by-step -step guide to developing affordable housing. So administration is presenting two development options as case studies for council's consideration. And just as a note, these case studies were put together to help illustrate potential costs and locations, not as sort of viable options to select from at this point in time. Um, the first considers developing on a vacant property in Centreville that is city owned. It's located on 50th Avenue and just off 50th Street. The property is in the main street district, so it's zoned appropriately for multi-unit development. 
um, but would also need to include some commercial uses as it, as it is planned as a mixed use site. Um, the housing site selector tool rates this parcel highly, giving it a score of 95 out of 100 for its proximity to amenities that families need and value. If we were to develop the minimum 35 units recommended, it would be in a four to six story apartment style building with commercial units on the main floor. Development could be a mix of one and two bedroom units meant for single adults and lone parent families. And the development cost is estimated between 12 to $15 million. The second case looks at a privately owned property along 50th Street and Colonial Way across from the Gallery and Montelay shopping centers. This vacant site is designated for commercial development in the MDP. So some of the site uh, needs to be dedicated uh, to retail or office uses in addition to residential. Um, it's also zoned appropriately as integrated neighborhood district allowing for multi-unit development. The housing site selector tool rates this site most highly for senior residents, giving it a score of 81.5 out of 100. Um, this property is over three times larger than the first, so a development of 35 units in a four-story apartment would only take up part of the site. If we are designing for lower income seniors, one bedroom units would be typically appropriate. Uh, the development cost is also estimated between 12 to 15 million because there are significant savings on square footage um, when you only develop one bedroom units. There are a number of grants and funding sources that other, other levels of government have made available to help cover capital costs, land purchase, and other project costs. So this includes the Government of Alberta's Affordable Housing Partnership Program, which may fund up to one third of the cost for mixed use, mixed income, mixed tenure, or specialized housing developments. Um, on the federal side, the most appropriate sources of funds are the Affordable Housing Fund, which provides low interest and or forgivable loans uh, to partnered organizations. The Rapid Housing Initiative, which has announced a new funding stream for affordable housing, supportive housing and shelters to be made available later in 2024. Um, and seed funding, which provides interest-free loans and or non-repayable contributions for pre-development activities. Other organizations such as the Federation of Canadian Municipalities offer additional funding, such as through the Sustainable Affordable Housing Program, which is geared towards projects with higher environmental performance standards. But it is important to note that funding from other levels of government is almost always contingent on or prioritized for projects that have dedicated municipal contributions. Municipalities have provided funding for housing projects in different ways, um, including one-time expenditures um, as part of the capital budget or a one-time debenture. However, a number of municipalities, uh, given the continuous housing need in their communities, have started to develop reserve funds that can be drawn from as needed for development projects. Um, finally, I'd like to end on a couple of other opportunities or considerations for Council. Habitat for Humanity still has an interest in working with the city on developing lower density affordable home ownership opportunities in Beaumont. The financial commitment is lower from the city, just the cost of land donation, and the staff time commitment is also lower in that habitat rather than the city will act as developer. Administration is also working towards a comprehensive growth plan and land management strategy this year, which will address how the city uses its resources to meet the demands for different services, and that includes non-market housing. This work will help to inform what types of municipally developed facilities to prioritize and whether there may be an opportunity to concurrently develop housing with other essential services. Administration recommends a number of next steps that would lead towards a more comprehensive program for affordable housing in the city, starting with investigating the creation of an affordable housing reserve fund, identifying smaller scale development opportunities such as with Habitat for Humanity, and then finally proceeding with development feasibility and project concept development um, with the Leduc Regional Housing Foundation. Um, this concludes my presentation and administration welcomes any questions from council on these topics. Hey, Ms. Tarnowski, I appreciate the presentation. With that, open up the questions from members of council and see Councillor Barnhart, you have your hand up. So Councillor Barnhart, you have the floor first. Thank you very much, Mayor, and thank you very much, uh, administration. I do appreciate you bringing this report forward and uh, uh, the work that's been going on, which I'm well aware of on the Leduc Regional Housing Foundation. I know that you've reached out to them and they've provided you with uh, some really good information. And 
uh, the, the demand, the need for housing, I think we all know it's, it's definitely growing. And anything municipalities can do, and often it's municipalities who have to do it, because like you said, other orders of government are not going to contribute if the municipality isn't uh, interested in contributing. A few things I just wanted to um, uh, make mention of in your presentation, and I, you might need to put it back up just so council can see what I'm talking about. Uh, on the, um, the history and details of Gates Landing 1 and 2, if you can find that page of the presentation, please. It's right at the beginning, I think. There you go. Yeah. Um, just, just wanted to point out a couple of things. Uh, when we prepared for this meeting, I was talking to the executive director. She mentioned that the, the rent in phase two is actually lower than we've put there. It's going to be $680 a month, which is actually... 40% um, below market. Mm -hmm. And the 20% um, the, the below market belongs with the first one. So the phase one, it, it, easy to get these numbers mixed up. I do it all the time. So just to clarify that. And the other thing is that the 8.6 million capital cost is the budget. And we're, we're knowing right now, because we have the grand opening coming up, that we're significantly under budget, which I don't think that ever happens. But just to put that out there, that we're a million dollars uh, to the good there in terms of not having to use contingencies, because we've had some excellent builders and, and the staff have done a really fine job there. So I'll say that basically to let uh, council know that the Duke Regional Housing Foundation is very much um, interested in working with the city but is not a developer either. We, we have to hire developers to do the project for the, for the Leduc Regional Housing as well. Um, but I'm, I'm just pleased to see this here. I think whatever the municipalities can do, it's the only way we're gonna make a difference in affordable housing. So I do appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor McCook, you have the floor. Thank you, Mayor. Um, yeah, I'm obviously a huge advocate for affordable housing and as there's clearly a need. Um, and something needs to be done. Um, part of me hesitates a little bit in in what our role looks like, um, just because I think a lot of this kind of should fall under the purview of the provincial and federal governments. Um, I, I know that obviously to Councillor Barnhart's um, point, there there is a role for municipalities to play, um, just kind of determining what what that is. Um, I also think that getting the comprehensive growth plan and land management strategy in place will be very important um, in order to kind of move this forward um, and understanding how we move forward as a city as well. Um, I just have a couple questions. So you identified that um, single senior females and lone parents will kind of be the core group within the next 10 years. Is that kind of Leduc Regional Housing Foundation numbers or is that Beaumont specific? Um, through the mayor to Councillor McCook, um, the Leduc Regional Housing Foundation's uh, needs assessment report uh, was divided out by municipality. Um, so that comes for specifically from the section about Beaumont. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Um, and then obviously the funding is often tied to municipal contribution, as you mentioned, um, and we have some funding options laid out there. How far into some of these projects do we need to be to access these funds? Um, again, through the mayor to Councillor McCook, uh, generally, um, so for instance, I was looking at the federal funding um, and they typically want to see the site design completed, um, sometimes the development permit already in place or issued by the municipality, um, and then any other sources of, you know, private financing in place. So quite far down the line, typically. Um, you, you have to spend a, um, the, typically that's what the seed funding is used for is to get you to that point where you're ready to actually apply for the um, larger funding um, portions or grants. Okay, so there is potential for us to kind of go down the path and not receive funding. <laughs> yeah, I mean, un unfortunately it's never a given. Mm -hmm. and, and that's one of the reasons why I think the Leduc Regional Housing Foundation is recommending that we sort of act as the developer and applicant in this instance, because they aren't confident that they would receive funding again so soon after, you know, for the Gates Landing project. And there is very, there are very high levels of competition from different yeah. um, housing yeah. management bodies across the province and the country. Yeah, perfect. Okay, thank you. And then, um, 
just a couple more yep. questions more that's okay okay um once built can you speak to or clarify um and per perhaps councillor barnhart might want to jump on in on this um the duke regional Ho um housing foundation's capacity to then run it um through the mayor, Councillor McCook. So through uh, capacity to run a facility in Beaumont, you mean? Mm -hmm. um, they've indicated that they have the capacity to operate it. It's just okay. the sort of capital funding that they don't have. Okay. And then um, would Habitat be able to build the kind of facility that's laid out in case study number one? Um, Habitat's model has moved away from um multi-unit style, especially apartment style developments, and they're focusing a lot more on lower density products, single family homes or semi-detached homes, sometimes right. townhomes, but that's really most of what you're seeing, at least in the Edmonton region from them. Okay, thank you. So essentially partnering with Habitat, we, um, we'd have to own or find a smaller lot. And okay, so yep. what's presented wouldn't kind of fit in the Habitat model. No. Okay. Um, okay, I think that's it for me now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Appreciate that. Councilman Newkirk, followed by Councillor Monkoff Swain. Councilman Newkirk, you have the floor. Yeah, thank you. And just wondering if you can clarify um, early on in the presentation uh, what you said around the Duke Regional Housing Foundation's ability to participate. I think they, I think what you said was, is they don't have the capacity to do the upfront work, but after it was all built, they could run it. Is that the Cole's notes on that? Um, through the mayor to Councillor Van Newkirk. Um, they uh, they would have the capacity to partner with us on the the development and, um, you know, design side of the project. Um, they don't have, I guess, what the the Gates Landing model, they developed through, through a consultant, that project themselves and, um, contributed a significant portion of their own, um, funds towards the capital cost. What their indication to us was, was that they couldn't do that. They couldn't necessarily lead the project, but they could definitely support the city in applying and um, constructing it, and then would take over as the operator once it was constructed. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, just wondering, like, what other options exist um for landing affordable housing projects in Beaumont um so we're you know we're talking about the Leduc Regional Housing Foundation you know in Edmonton they have Savidia and they've done all kinds of projects in the community I think they have one in St. Albert um are there other organizations such as that that also do this type and style of work or is there private entities that can take this on and the reason I'm asking is because um, you know, what you, what you said next after that is we don't have the horsepower and talent here to do it anyways, and we'd be hiring it out, right? And so hiring it out is basically other consultants or different private entities or whatever. So that's the piece that I'm, you know, exploring here. What does that look like? Um, through the mayor to Councillor Van Newkirk, there are, there are a limited number of organizations that um, develop affordable housing in the region. Most of the organizations that are active right now are the housing management bodies, which have a specific jurisdiction. Um, so I think there's like Heartland um, Housing Foundation, um, which works uh, in a different part of the Edmonton region. There are a few private developers, but um, we had reached out to organizations through the Housing um, Site Selector Tool Project. Um, there just isn't a lot of capacity within the nonprofit sector to, you know, come to municipalities with a, an idea in mind and, and ready to go, being shovel ready with, a, with an idea. Um, so I know one of the big um, focus areas for Edmonton is actually devoting staff time and resources to building that sector because there just is very little capacity that exists. Beaumont, we haven't received, you know, to my knowledge, really any sort of interest in developing here an affordable housing facility. Um, and in conversations with Margot Haggerty at the Leduc Regional Housing Foundation, um, she's sort of been approached by the development community, the, the um, for-profit development community, and that you're typically looking for some sort of rate of return on a project. And she has had to explain to them um, you know, when you add in affordable housing units 
for instance, in like a mixed income project, it typically doesn't yield the types of returns that they would be expecting. So those projects haven't materialized in the past for them. So that's sort of the, the context that we're working with. Yeah, and I think that really explains the landscape. Like for, for me, it's apparent that this doesn't happen without a significant municipal push. Like that, that's that's where it comes back to. So um, that, you know, would need to be weighed alongside all the other priorities that we have for staffing and funding and all the interesting conversations we're going to have at budget. So um, I was hoping for different news, not expecting to find it, but I just wanted to ask a little bit deeper into that around, you know, who else might be doing it, right? But okay, appreciate your answers. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. It comes from Rockoff Swain. You have the floor. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, maybe I'll, I'll go with, with Steve. And I know there's some recommendations on this. Council wants to begin to bring something back to I'm sorry, you're, you're cutting out quite a bit. We have trouble understanding what you're saying. Sorry. Um, maybe turn your video off and see if you get a better sound feed. You really can't hear you very well. Let's try again, please. Go to someone else and I'll, I'll try to figure out my internet. Still a little bit of garble, sorry. Let's, let's keep going and we'll try and help, hope, help you can hear you better. Okay, thank you. I just saw a flash of message here. Thank you. We'll come back to Council Michael Swain in a moment here. I have a question before I go to the second round uh, of questions here. So, Mr. Tarnowski, so part of the presentation talked about Habitat with Humanity, and I remember the presentation they gave us a while ago, that they would act as the developer in a situation. So would that mitigate some of the risk uh, Boma would face? Because we would not only be the developer, we would be involved with providing land, I'm assuming, but they would act as the developer of the project and would actually look after building it so that would mitigate some of our risk uh, as one scenario from your presentation. Is that a correct assessment? Uh, yeah, thank you, Mayor Danilak. Um, That would be correct. When we met with them, they generally have asked only for the land as well as maybe a um, the municipality to act as a liaison with the, de the development community because typically they'll be looking for certain concessions from um, uh, for instance, the local developers who already own land or have the construction arm so that they can get better rates for their projects, but they are the ones coordinating, um, you know, all of the construction, all of the consultants that would need to be hired. So there's a definitely a lower level of commitment from us. Thank you for clarifying that. Uh, well, Sam's working on his audio and video uh, where he's located currently. I'll go to Councillor Barnard for another question, then we'll go back to Sam and then if, if we can't continue with Sam, we'll, we'll wrap up this section and keep going. Councilor Barnard. Thank, thank you, Mayor. Um, one of the points I wanted to make sure was very clear is that uh, when we're talking about Leduc Regional Housing Foundation, in many respects, we're talking about an, um, an extension of this council because we are members. We are members. Is Sam speaking now? Can you, are you speaking now, Sam? No, I'm on mute now, sorry. Okay, we'll come back to Sam in a moment. Okay. Wait, Kathy. Sorry about that. Mm -hmm. um, and so as a member of, the city of Beaumont is a member of the Leduc Regional Housing Foundation. And so I just wanna put out there that council would be um, playing two roles in, in, in effect. We have uh, a clear line of sight as to what is happening at Leduc Regional Housing Foundation. It's a public organization, as you mentioned, a management body, a housing management body. So anything that the Housing Foundation does is, is very transparent, very open, and not in it for making, making money, in it for providing additional housing in our community. So I wanna make that point. Uh, second thing is about the role of the Leduc Regional Housing Foundation and its capacity. I think we're using that in two different ways. The Duke Regional Housing does not have capital money to invest in a project, but it definitely has expertise in property management. And so that's where it would come in. And of course, when you manage any property, there's usually a fee of some kind, no matter who does it for, uh, for the developer. So uh, I think that's just a matter of who, who's chosen. And one of the um, uh, 
uh, I guess the uh, examples of how that is working. We have a private developer right now that's approaching uh, the Leduc Regional Housing Foundation to be that property manager, because if there's anything we know, it's, it's how to help people who are looking for affordable housing and to make the right connections, make the right match with the people that are uh, looking for the type of housing, where it's located, what services they need, uh, what rents they can afford. All of that is very well worked out at the Housing Foundation. Um, I kind of want to say as well that the foundation is a bit like how we connect with the Water Commission. They're the experts in housing in our region, in, in affordable housing. And so I think that's something to be recognized and appreciated. And last but not least is that the Gates Landing would not have happened if it wasn't for the city of Beaumont, as well as the city of Leduc and all the other municipalities that have contributed. Uh, they're located in the city of Leduc, but they're available to residents of our region. And it could not have happened if in this last one in particular, the city of Leduc um, backstopped with $500,000 and this happened like over Christmas. And I came back here and said, can, can we help as well? So we've, we've always been involved with the foundation and uh, I think that relationship um, speaks for itself, but I just wanted to as well uh, underline some of the, the differences. And one last thing, I promise. Habitat for Humanity is also a good option. It's not either or, but you're getting very different amounts of units of housing. In one case, you're getting affordable housing for maybe 20 to 30 to 40 units. Habitat for Humanity, yes, it's it's hitting another, it's more the transitionary level where you might have a family ready to move out of social housing and have ownership, but you might have one, maybe two families in a duplex. So it's a very different model. Right. Appreciate Thank that. You. Thank you, Councillor. I'll try coming back to Councillor Markoff Swain and see if he has a better connection. We can hopefully hear him better. Sam, if you're able to continue with your question at this time. Yeah, does that sound better? Yeah, it does considerably. Yes, thanks. Okay. Um, so, so apologies again. We'll, we'll blame uh, the province of Manitoba for internet. Um, th thanks for the report. Um, I'll just briefly pick up on Councillor McCook's comment about, you know, would would hope that the province and the feds did more. Um, so, so yes, but we can only continue to admire the problem for so long. Uh, the reality is they're not stepping up. Uh, even even though that they they uh, proclaim to be, so the only way this is going to happen is uh, is we lean in. Uh, and I, I've shared before uh, with this council uh, is it's it's time that we do that. The capital numbers in there are obviously daunting, scary, uh, but as outlined here, um, you know, it's not going to end up at that number for Beaumont, uh, or else we we wouldn't be able to do it. So I I personally and. Um, and I know there's some potential next steps in there, and, and I'm I'm a, a strong advocate uh, of moving forward with this. Um, I I assume uh, I guess first question I, I assume that if we were to to provide the direction to administration to look at some of the the seed funding as part of this, that this would come back for a discussion at budget. Is that is that the right timing thinking around this? Mr. Wong or Ms. Tarnowski? You're on, it's good, yeah. I think for the uh, for the question that Councilor McCosby is asking, uh, administration would, uh, would desire for the council to give us some directions on what the next step would be to take. For example, uh, if there is a, a specific um, a project, so for, we, we talk about Habitat for Humanity, uh, maybe uh, there is a direction for us to negotiate with them. And uh, in the council report also, we mentioned about uh, the city may want to establish a reserve fund uh, to start those state funding. So that may be another direction that the uh, the council can give. Yeah, and, and thanks for that. And, and that's where I was gonna go was those, those potential next steps. Um, uh, and my question was, if we directed you to bring those next steps back, does that come back at budget? But I'll, I'll go the other way around. Um, sh short answer is um, I, I don't know where the best project is to, to Councillor Barnhart's point. The Leduc Regional Housing Foundation are the experts and, and, and you know, tr trust them. But um, I, I would be in, in favor of, of directing administration to, to look at dedicated municipal loan land um, for, for a project of this concept. Um, personally, um, you know, the Habitat for Humanity is, is, is a great option, but I don't think that that is going to solve the, the larger need. Um, and so I, I would be in favor of both of the, the, the two steps outlined there on, uh, on page 15 of the, of the agenda package. Um, so I'll, I'll, 
I'll, I'll leave it there. Um, you know, asking administration to to explore that plus to look at that that reserve fund. I, I don't think has a huge uh, financial uh, impact. Uh, and so correct me if I'm wrong, but th that's what I'd like to see back at budget is to talk about some of the options. Um, and uh, I don't think for uh, council should be kind of picking and choosing. So so go back consulting with the Regional Housing Foundation uh, and then bringing back the concepts of uh, a municipal owned um, portion as well as that that. Um, that, that fund that was that's referenced in the report. So that's just where I am on this. Uh, we need to do something. Can't wait for anyone else. Um, and uh, let's let's get the information for budget, and and then we weigh it against the rest of the capital items uh, that are in front of us. Okay. Thank you, Councillor. I mean, Ms. Ms. Raymond wants to jump in on the con on the conversation. Ms. Raymond. Thank you, Mayor. Lots of really great conversation here. I think that what administration is proposing is that. The next step should be to define what that program looks like for affordable housing for Beaumont. So then we can actually define what those prior parameters are and be able to set that funding um, and capitalize that. Without understanding, there's too many different scales, I think, in terms of where we can go with affordable housing, whether that is the, um, uh, the habitat model or going towards more of a larger scale Gates Landing type project, which may or may not be feasible here at the city, but this would set all those parameters and that principles for council to be able to consider through the budget process. I am concerned with the timing a little bit where we're here in July, um, we are preparing budget. Um, if we're going to develop that and have those principles available, that does take staff resources, which they're really, um, something would need to come off of the work plate of long range planning to be able to take on affordable housing. It's a program onto itself and we need to have some time for that as I'm not sure that it can actually be brought back in time for budget. Although I think Mr. Wong is eager to support council in whichever way that he can, uh, we would need to take that back and actually take a look at where that is. Cause we're also working on urban agriculture as well as a number of other projects. So um, we definitely understand that council wants to do something and that time is of the essence though. So we would be looking to complete that pro like that project um, as quickly as we could, but I'm not entirely sure how much work and effort needs to go into that at that point to be able to commit to a timeline. Thank you, Ms. Raymond. Uh, next, I have Councilman Atelibus, called by Councilman Newkirk. Councilman Atelibus. Can, can I just speak? No, sorry, no. Bill. Can, oh. can I just follow up on that? Yeah, okay, quickly. Yeah, go, not quickly. Sorry, I, I didn't see your hand on my no. apology. No, no, that's fine. Yeah, and, and so, uh, Ms. Raymond, I, I asked the question on would it come back to budget, right? But if, if that's not the right time frame, then you tell us, right? What I'm saying is, for me personally, um, the, the parameter for me is, is the larger um, Gates Landing type, type concept and see what that looks like, right? And if that doesn't make it for this budget, then we continue that on. Um, so, yeah, you, you tell me what the timing is, but just I just wanted to be clear. I'm not pushing for budget. I'm just asking you to, um, when it's feasible. So I'll leave it there, Bill, and let others jump in. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Talibus, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Mayor. I, <clears throat> sorry, just looking for clarity on process because I see this as information only, uh, valuable information here. But uh, in terms of next steps, uh, wouldn't the process be to either put forward a notice of motion or request for additional information? or inquiry, and I guess I'm asking administration. Madam Clerk or Ms. Raymond, Mr. Wong, I'm assuming that would be the same procedure as well. Madam Clerk. Thank you, Mayor, through you to Council and Intel and Boss. Um, there are some recommendations within the report and if Council wants to move forward providing that direction to, count, uh, to administration this evening, then we can definitely work with a motion to move that forward. So a motion to proceed in a different way or simply receive receiving is information. So I guess, yeah, yeah just, sure. the, I mean, the way we received it, it was information only, you know, no action required. So um, I would like to keep it that way. And if there is a motion that's being put forward as, as we run through the, you know, the process of, of doing that formally as we normally would. Okay, appreciate that. And we can accept the report for information this evening. A council is welcome to speak to administration or the council and figure out a motion for the next council meeting to, to bring this, uh, this topic forward. Sorry, what? I could make a motion based on the recommendation. Which is to accept information, right? No, there's other. Okay, I got things coming in different ways here. Let me finish off the 
the questions first. Okay, going up here, Councillor. Oh, Madam Clerk, your hands up again. Yes, thank you, Mayor. Through you to Councillor Natal Boss and Councillor Barnhart. Yes, the report is to receive for information. However, if council would like to make a motion this evening to provide direction to administration to move forward, say with a partnership, looking into a partnership with the um, municipally owned land, Leduc Regional Housing, we could make those motions this evening and provide that direction to us. At a later time in the, in the meeting, correct? No, or Mayor, now? we could do that now. We don't have to put the motion forward with regards to receiving right. for information. We would just put the motion yeah. forward for providing direction on how we want to proceed. Yeah, it can be done now. I, I get that. At the same time, it can be done later this evening as well, too, right? It's not motioning on the fly, so which we're trying to avoid doing sometimes from discussions before or not. Madam Clerk? We would want to put the motion forward when we're discussing this item. Okay which is fine. I am listening to the way council's going and I do believe that I could put some motions forward that council could look for consideration. Okay. I think just speaking to that, my concern is there's not enough information in terms of how much it's going to cost upfront cost to do these assessments and determine this. So that's my concern with going ahead with this right now. Oh, appreciate that. I'm going to take the last set, the last question from Councilman Newkirk and then we'll see about a motion to accept his information or other motions possibly. Councilman Newkirk, you have the floor. Yeah, thank you, uh, Mayor. Um, going down the uh, similar thought pattern to Councillor Helen Boss, I think that if we're going, to, if there's any appetite to do anything more with this tonight, um, we would, I, I would want to see um, administration working with the administrative resources in a timeline that fits administration, rather mm -hmm. than engaging consultants to get this done at this point. Mm -hmm. Like that, that's kind of where my head is going, and and. Uh, understanding what that timeline is with administration. We have so much important work at play right now. I just don't want to uh, overwhelm or rush anything else that we're already tasked administration work to shoehorn this in. So, you know, like, you know, do we do something here and approve something that's a year out? That might be what we're looking at. So anyway, it's just some comments around where my thoughts are to move this forward. So I agree with you. Thank you. All right, seeing much more. Further members of council wanting to speak, Councillor Barnard, do you have a comment or a question? Okay. Councillor Barnard. I, I, would, I would like to make the motion, but I know others have taken time to develop that motion before it's put forward. And I wonder if I could have the same privilege. Um, okay. Because I, I, I don't exactly like the next steps that are here, given the conversation that I've heard so far, but I, I would like to move this forward. And I, I, I think a few others might be wishing to do that as well. So a motion so, different than accepting the information it, Yes, I'd like to actually get some more detailed information so that council okay. can make a decision as to whether to proceed or not. So we can take so a five minute break. Took while a we... recess to develop that. That would be appreciated. Madam Clerk, take a five minute break while you, we take a moment to get this motion clarified and come back after five minute break. Okay, we are in recess for five minutes. Exactly. Okay, we are back live after a short recess for administrative assistance. Uh, one of our councillors that took less time than I thought for the break, which is a good thing. So with that, I will open the floor to Councillor Barnhart to, to carry on the conversation. Councillor Barnhart. Thank you very much, uh, Mayor. I'm looking for the administration to put the proposed motion on the screen. And I'll just speak to it once we make it. Uh, uh, please make your motion and then speak to it, please. All right. So that the administration be authorized to negotiate with the Duke Regional Housing on options for advancing and affordable housing development, similar in scope to Gates Landing Development in Leduc, and that by the end of 2024, the administration provide a report on potential next steps. And that by the end of 2024, this, I'm, I'm, I wanna stop at the first one if I could for now. I, I'm not really understanding why I would have to develop the fund but if I could speak to the first one, uh, Council, if you're... Yes, let's speak that. to your first motion, um, and then we'll continue once we deal with the first motion. If yes, you well, what, thank you, Mayor. One of the things that I realize is that um, there's a bit of angst about budget time. Of course, there always is, and there should be. But this is not something that happens quickly. Uh, these projects, the Gates Landing 1 took five or six years, and Gates Landing 2 took two or three more years. These are difficult projects to put together and to get the funding and the, and the grants, et cetera. So I'm much more uh, interested in us moving forward 
on this and looking at what the costs are, looking at where we might put it, look at all from every angle that we need to look at it from. And I think if that report came back by the end of 2024, that would be uh, that would be fine for me. And I, the sooner the better, but I understand that we just can't rush some of these things. We have to do the, the legwork that comes with that. And if we don't want to hire outside consultants, then of course that's even more of a consideration. And uh, uh, I think it's doable to do in-house and with the help of Leduc Regional Foundation, because there is some expertise there as well, a lot of expertise now. Uh, so I uh, I'm, would speak to that first one. I would like to put that motion. Okay. Uh, whether or not the second one needs to go, I don't know. Okay, good enough. You spoke your motion. At this time, open the count members of council to discussion on the motion that Council Barnett has put forward. Sam, I see your hand is up. Then I'll go to Council Telebus, followed by Council McCook. Sam, you have the floor. Yeah, thank you. Um, I, uh, I think it's a very, very reasonable motion. Um, you know, my, my concern, and, and we've, we've dealt with this before, where administration recommends receiving this information and, and catching people off guard. Um, th there are next steps in the report, and I think Councillor Barnhart is, is, is exercising that. I, I also take uh, Councillor Van Newkirk's point around priorities, and, and so de definitely not wanting to, to push timelines. Uh, I think uh, I'd like to hear from administration, but I'm assuming that this is relatively reasonable. Uh, and if not, like in the past that I've come back by the end of, if it gets to the end of 2024 and they can't uh, execute it, then they just simply come back and ask for an extension. So um, alternative, like if, if this motion votes gets voted down and, and we are just accepted for information, then when does it come back, right? Um, no, no one's committing to spend anything right now. Um, what we're doing is looking for, for information or reports. So uh, thanks to Council Barnhart for bringing this forward. Um, appreciate that. And, and I will be supporting this this motion. Thank you, Councillor. Appreciate that uh, those comments. Councillor Telebus, followed by Councillor McCook. Councillor Telebus, you have the floor. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I guess just uh, again looking for a little clarity as to exactly what this means. Um, if it's just requesting a little more information and some conversation with Leduc Re Regional Housing Foundation, um, then I'm okay with that. But my concern is if there's going to be uh, quite a bit of funds allocated to this project then it becomes a different conversation. So looking for clarity on the administration side as to what this entails and if this is something you feel is achievable at this point in time um, with the focus on a lot of the other priorities that, that exist uh, currently, so. Microphone's on, Ms. Raymond. Thank you. From, through the mayor to Councillor Natal and Boss, yes, this is acceptable. This is work that administration can do within this time frame and be able to come back with um, all of that which is listed in here in this time frame. So thank you. And sorry, just costing. Is yeah. that within existing funding? The, all the costing would be done internally. So yes, not needing external support. Okay, perfect. Uh, although I do have uh, quite a few concerns in terms of some of the proposed areas of, of putting a facility like this uh, in other individuals' backyards with a four to six story building, um, I am open to uh, additional information if it comes at no cost. So I'll be supporting this as well. Thank you, Councillor. Appreciate that. Councillor McCook, followed by Councillor Newkirk. Councillor McCook, Kat, you have the floor. Thank you. Um, kind of my, some of my questions have been answered, um, but uh, Ms. Raymond, how does this ask kind of differ or from what you mentioned, kind of about putting some sort of affordable housing guidelines together. Through the mayor to uh, Councillor McCook, I think that that's actually more on the second option would be more um, that next one that uh, this winter has there. So you've got that there would be a report on the development of an affordable housing reserve fund that could actually be an affordable housing program and then that program could include the information on those options for establishing and capitalizing the program. So this would be just more tangible. It's um, the first one is uh, more tactical um, and it is something with known parameters, I think that exist in what Gates Landing is and being able to work through that. So there are some defined parameters there. And then the second one would be actually to continuing to build on that and to create that program. So if we did change it that way, so whether that says fund or um, program, couple of different ways. Okay, thank you for the clarity. Um, yeah, I, as Councillor Barnhart said, you know, the projects like these take years often. Um, and in five years, where are we gonna be at? 
um, as it pertains to our housing issues. Um, so I'm obviously supportive of getting more information. So thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Appreciate that. Councillor Newkirk, followed by Councillor Penrod. Councillor Newkirk, Steve, you have the floor. Yeah, <clears throat> thank you. And thank you, Councillor Barnhart, for trying to keep things moving here. Um, trying not to stick a spoke in the wheels here, but Beaumont's moving and shaking. And there's lots going on, lots of people coming, lots of businesses coming. Everybody wants to find a deal to make the next new thing. We're hurting for more commercial development. And Beaumont has land assets that may need to be leveraged along the way to do that. So my, my concern is that if we embark down a finding information plan and gather a bunch of information that considers, you know, land parcels A, B, and C, and that takes till the end of the year or, you know, needs an extension to the next quarter, yet somewhere along the way, one of those land, land assets doesn't become available for this anymore. Then we have to go and dig up another piece of land to put it on or the options are reduced. And I just wonder if a better approach isn't to, um, pick a piece of land to do a study on so that people understand what land is at play. Um, so that, that's my first, my first comment. Um, second comment, and then I'll have a question is around the, the, the funding for this and the Duke regional housing foundation has an ability to levy tax roll and they are also a nonprofit. Um, and I'm just wondering like, how do we, and maybe this is a question if if the next motion gets on the floor. Um, administration, maybe let me know if this doesn't fit with this motion. But my question is, is how do we integrate planning for the future into this? And I think the study, I think it's the reserve fund. And I think it's talking to the Ludic Regional Housing Foundation and figuring out how to make a program and fund it and make it self-funding over time and all of those things. So maybe I'll start with that com uh, question to administration. So the question, the question is, is on the funding for this piece that has to be done right now, um, you know, we're going to use internal resources to do that, but anything that comes out of this, we still have to figure out how to fund in the future. So the future funding that would come out of this, I guess I'm, I'm hesitant to do this work if we can't fund the next step. That, that's what my, that's what my concern is. And if we don't have the levers to pull to fund the next steps, then I think we need to gauge how we're going to do this information gathering differently. Um, through the mayor to Councillor Van Newkirk, I, I do think that um, that would be something that we would look at in developing a affordable housing program is its sustainability into the future and where the sources of funding would come from. Um, uh, and then I think some of the questions around the use of land um, in the city and whether it needs to be dedicated to other uses um, that the city has prioritized will be addressed in that comprehensive land management strategy because we're going to be looking at municipal facilities. Um, what do we need to prioritize as we grow? Um, and do we have greater priorities than affordable housing or do we need to prioritize that over others? So I think those questions um, will be addressed through that project in addition to looking at how we develop a specifically um, affordable housing program and potential reserve fund. Yeah, yeah, I get that. Um, I'm not hesitating on supporting the motion, Councillor Barnhart. I'm, I'm hesitating on if we get this piece of information, I'm not even convinced that we have the ability to fund the future. And so if we don't have the ability to fund the future, why are we going to send administration off to do this body of work? And maybe just some, help, help me along here. Okay, let's break protocol. Kathy, why don't you reply back to Steve and then I'll go to Councillor Penrod and we'll kind of move on to the next phase of the, of the motion. Councillor Barnhart. Thank you, Councillor Van Newkirk. Really good question. I just wanted to put in your in your head as well what's happening uh, right now at Gates Landing. It's an affordable housing operation and uh, the Gates Landing one is actually doing very well, much better than any of us expected. When the capital and the land and the municipalities take care of that amortization cost and, and that piece of it, then the foundation can operate it and in a way that it doesn't cost a whole lot of money to do so. So there are models with commercial on one level and, and yeah. residential above that that actually can make it work. And we, we have that information. It's just a matter of getting all the partners together on the same page to actually do that. 
So it is project by project. That's one of the challenges here. And that's why I believe the administration is recommending a fund, but then council doesn't have to have this debate for each project. It can go to the fund until the fund is no longer available. Yeah, yeah. And I think what I'm struggling with in my head is the right order to actually do this because we send administration out to do this body of work and get us a bunch of supposed scenarios. And then let's say the land management strategy pulls one of those pieces of land out of the, out of the supposed scenario. And that might've been our favorite. Then we got to send them back to do this again. Is, you know, are we better to get the funding options, models and examples in front of us? So we understand how we're actually going to move this and fund this into the future before we start going, looking at pieces of land. You know, I, and I don't know what the right answer is. That's that's what I'm struggling with. Yeah. Okay. That's enough for me, Mayor. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Councillor. I'll go to Councillor Penrod, and I see Councillor Bogoff Swain hand is up again. So I'll go to the two of you, and then I'll have a couple of comments, and move on to the onto this motion, and we'll move this along as best we can. Councillor Penrod, please. Thank you, Mayor Donnelly. Uh, again, I just want to pose a couple questions for some clarity. Give Councillor Barnhart an opportunity to share some of her collected wisdom from her years serving with the uh, LRHF, the Luduk Regional Housing Foundation. Um, so on the first hand, I just wondered from, from your perspective, what are the other projects? So one question that I have is to Councillor Van Newkirk's point, um, Beaumont's growing rapidly. It would seem that Beaumont wouldn't be the cheapest option in the region to build something but um so i'm wondering if there's if the lrhf is kind of proposing similar projects in all of the partner municipalities or is this targeted specifically to beaumont i get that the needs are here in beaumont and across the region and across the country it sounds like i just wanted to give you an opportunity to speak to that Councilor Barnhart, you want to reply back? Thank, right? thank you, Mayor, and thank you, Councilor Penrod. Uh, Leduc Regional Housing Foundation has, this will be its 20, the one that's opening this week coming up, will be their 20th building. So, uh, and they're located all across the region. Uh, Warburg um, has a, a lodge and, and Kalmar, you know, is part of the, the whole, uh, it, it's not just the large cities, it's also the small towns and municipalities that are involved. Understandably, every small municipality in town can't afford the services that go along with having affordable housing or having supportive living uh, lodges in them. So as a region, we work collaboratively. We work really well together on finding locations where different housing uh, models can take shape and get started. And we have actually a business plan. I brought it with me if anybody wants to look at it. And we're looking at another uh, facility here in Beaumont for seniors, for self-contained. We have a couple of facilities here now, affordable housing as well as uh, senior self-contained. Mm -hmm. And so there are other projects that are already on the books with Leduc Regional Housing for capital investment, if we can raise the capital to do so. This one is not one of them yet. And it, the reason it isn't is because we're not considering at this point putting more capital dollars into Beaumont. But there's, at this point, other than for the senior self-contained. But if there was a desire to work together, we're more than happy to do that. So Leduc was, uh, the city of Leduc came forward with the support for the Gates Landing 2, which from the city of Leduc's perspective, they, they see the demand and the need in their community. So they wanted it sooner. So they, they helped make it happen. There isn't an easy answer to your question because it does depend on where the land is, where the capital is, where the demand is. And we've done the needs assessment uh, for each of the municipalities so that we can have a better handle on that and know when we build it, who will need it, who, who are we building it for, because that makes a big difference as well. So I don't know if that's exactly what you're looking for, but to say we, we do have a strategy and willing to work with any of the partners. And that's why I said this one isn't high on our priority list right now, but it takes so many years to get there mm. that I think it will be very quickly. Yeah. So my, my second question related is, um, I think we're presuming that a lot of the work will be done by Beaumont's administration. What I'm a bit curious as to, it sounds like there's a lot of capacity and a lot of expertise. I, I thought it was an interesting example that you gave that um, the Regional Housing Foundation is not dissimilar to Aero Utilities or another one of these external committees where we collaborate with other neighboring municipalities to do these big very specialized capital intensive projects. Um, so I'm just 
if you want to speak briefly to to that, maybe we're overestimating the amount of work this will require of Beaumont's administration. Maybe it's more a matter of just authorizing our administration to enter into these kind of discussions and and negotiations with LRHF where there there is maybe some excess capacity that can help us along the way. Interesting question. And I mean, the administration knows better than I do what their capacity is to, to develop this. But what I know from what we've done in the past is certainly finding the site is number one, you know, where is it going to be? And the administration has put forward two options that they know of. Uh, I'm sure they're going to need council to weigh in on on those options and the costs are going to be directly related to how many units what building developing the pro forma is what i know best takes the most time and that's looking at who's going to rent it how are we going to rent it how are we how are we going to operate it that's where i believe the duke regional housing foundation has the most uh experience and expertise and i i believe margot has been very she's not charging for the amount of time she's spending with you now uh, she's doing that very much as one of the partner municipalities but when it comes down to actually doing the work to get the proposal developing that and and actually all of that uh, report writing that has to happen uh, i think then it comes back to the administration mostly report writing and bringing it to council i think that's a big part of it and that's not easy mm. that takes a lot of time but i i think the the rest of it is has been help uh, helpful in terms of what margo's given you so far they, they might be answering better miss raymond thank you just a couple of things um just as i've been listening here one is that the direction to proceed with this work is uh, contained within the affordable housing strategy under strategic directions one and two, which are to support investment in local affordable housing through municipal policies, processes, and tools. And two was to develop partnerships and capacity among organizations with a role in housing provision in Beaumont. I think one of the things that I've heard though is we did provide options. They were illustrative options. We have not talked to the owner of that privately owned site about that feasibility of this for this type of development. So it was illustrative. So we couldn't say, yes, we want to put this affordable housing site there and then be able to proceed with that because we have not actually approached mm -hmm. them for that. It was something that was suitable, met that criteria that we've been developing through the housing supply challenge and that work we've been doing with CMHC. So to say, yes, we want to put that there, that isn't known at this time. So uh, just putting that parameter out there. Thanks very much. One more quick question from Sam, and then we'll uh, move it along here. Sam, you have the floor. Yeah, thanks. I, I wanted to go exactly to, to where Ms. Raymond went, um, and, and Councillor Ben Newkirk spoke about this. I think it's a little ambiguous right now, hearing the questions. Um, I, I wonder if we can, we can focus the information, the report around that case study one. Um, now, that, that doesn't to, to Councillor, uh, to Ms. Raymond's point, that doesn't mean that anyone's picking it, that that site, that we're, we're way, way, way away from that. But I, I think what, what would help this is just to get some clarity around if we use that as an example, as a case study, this is what it could look like. Um, and, and then I think that at least drives folks to, to, to something as opposed to just looking across the board. So I, I'm wondering, um, Councillor Barnhart, I, I see uh, Councillor Van Newkirk is, is flashing as well, but I'm wondering if there's a, a way to, to, to use that um, uh, use uh, that case study one as kind of a basis for admin to, to, to bank this on uh, and, and work through it. Um, clearly, just reinforce, no one's picking the site. It doesn't mean it's going there, but I, I think that might help us and, and quite frankly, administration um, kind of zone in on, on exactly what we're trying to find here. So I would ask that, but I, I see uh, Councilman Newkirk has, has got his hand up. Quick comment, Steve. Yeah, I think, <clears throat> thank you. Um, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, so I think a bunch of my rambling earlier was picked up by Councillor Monkoff Swain there around, if we were focusing on something, it feels a little bit better. Um, so if there was, you know, and to Ms. Raymond's point, uh, let's not do a case study on land we don't own. Um, so if we did use land that we owned to do a case study on, again, not picking a site, we're just using what's in front of us right now. If we, if we focused a case study on that number one option, I think we all know what we're, um, or I think administration would be more targeted. I worry about the a final report with without a target just being a little bit too broad and us redoing this conversation 
again. So, um, you know, Councillor Monkoff Swain, if there was a, a friendly amendment in there that yourself and um, Councillor Barnhart worked out, I think that might just be the ticket here. So just my thoughts. Councillor Barnhart. Thank you very much. Uh, I would be pleased to make an amendment to this if that would help and put uh, using sure. case study number one, if Option. that's okay, the administration feels that would work. Okay. Um, I guess we'd stick it in there somewhere on a on options for advancing case study one as an affordable housing development. Okay. I'm, well, I'm pleased that, with that. Our Madam Clerk, just worse with this slightly. Councillor Telebus, you have a comment to make while we're doing that? Councillor Telebus. I guess just for, for clarity, I know that we're using a, a certain scenario here, um, but I want to make it very clear that this is not the approach we're necessarily taking because I would probably have to remove myself, well, not remove myself, but uh, vote against if we're actually um, proceeding with this location and that's our intention without getting a little more information and researching it. So, um, yeah, I, I just, I feel like we're all over the map right now and maybe this is a rushed motion. So uh, for that reason, I'm, I'm on the fence and, and I might not be supporting this one just because it's going each and every which way. Yeah, my understanding is it's going to be a case study based on this one particular option to get an idea what would it cost. Not, not, a, it. not a commitment. For us. No, I appreciate the perspective. Thank you. Is it complete? No, not quite. Bill, while that's going on, if you don't mind, um, I, I would, I would maybe just change the, the language. Where I don't think we're advancing case study. I think we're using case study one as an example. Uh, advancing to me it seems to go down Nathan's concern, which I have as well. That if we're advancing it, then it looks like we're actually doing that site. So I think it's, um, it's using um, similar in scope to Gates Landing. Uh, development in Leduc using um, uh, uh, example one uh, or using case study one as an example um, and that by the end of 2024 I think to me that that's that's clear that we're not picking any site we just want to get some specific information around a, a site advancing is a bit of a word there I get that okay well let's take well, we'll just take a moment here, and Madam Clerk is just working on it here. Uh, quickly, okay, Councilor Barner, go comment. Thank you, Mayor. And I'm going to wrap this, this up here. We have been uh, spending a lot of time on it, but it's because housing is such an important, such an important issue in our region and our community. And I, I don't think we're rushing. We've we've developed an affordable housing strategy. This is moving it further down the road because we actually know we need to do this. So I don't at all think that we're rushing. Perhaps this motion was was put together this way because uh, I didn't see any other options available at the time. But uh, I don't appreciate that you think we're rushing because we've been on this for quite a while. Thank you. Okay. We'll uh, get the revised motion on the screen here and then we can move to a vote. Yep. Administration requested a five. All right. We're back live after a short recess. Finish readily to work on this motion here. How are we doing with Madam Clerk on the motion? All right. Councilor Barnhart, it's your motion has been slightly adopted, slightly amended. Pardon me. Let's have a look through it. Thank you. Why don't you have a look through it? Make sure you want to read it again. You're ready to go. Um, I, I, I think I'm prepared to make it, but I would like to speak to it, if, if that's okay. So I, I will make the motion. Yes. Did we take out advancing? That's one word I'm looking for. Developing. Okay. Okay. 
Uh, thank you, Mayor, and thank you, Administration, for helping do this. Um, I move that administration be authorized to negotiate with Leduc Regional Housing Foundation on options for developing an affordable housing development similar in scope to the Gates Landing development in Leduc on the case study one land as set out in the June 25th, 2024 report. And that by the end of 2024, administration provide a report on potential next steps. So thank you. Uh, that, that's the motion. But what I, what I want to say is the word negotiate, first of all, does not mean that we're asking Leduc Regional Housing Foundation necessarily to take it on. We're looking to Leduc Regional Housing Foundation to help develop the options and what that would look like. I think this sounds, it, it does come across when I read it again, that um, we actually have a project developed. We don't. What we're, what council, I believe, is prepared to uh, think about and consider is finding out more information and I know you need a piece of land in order to get that. Like, I know I know how this works. You need to have an example to be able to bring that back to council. But perhaps the case study one that we've identified, you've identified may not be the one we end up going with in the long run, but you need that. If I'm, I see your heads are shaking. Uh, you, you need that in order to put the numbers together on the piece of paper that you could show council. If it's here, this is how many units and this is what it would cost and this is who would manage it. This is how it would run. Why I think it's important to go forward with this uh, right now is that the administration needs the direction from council that this council is serious about addressing affordable housing in some way, shape or form as soon as possible in our community. And this does not in any way tie council's hands as to A, are we doing it? And B, where's it going to be? This gives council information. So if the words don't say that, then we need to change the words, but that's the intent. And I think the, the administration is confirming that that's their intent. So with that, Mayor, I, I would like to make this motion. Yeah, so the word is now consult instead of negotiate. That oh, sounds better. Where did it go? To consult with. To yes. consult. Yes, that would be. Okay, so let's read the motion one more time and then we'll open to discussion. Kind of a, a, group, a group motion here. Uh, that administration consult with the Duke Regional Housing Foundation on options for developing an affordable housing development, similar in scope to the Gates Landing development in the Duke on the case study one land as set out in the June 25th, 2024 report, and that by the end of 2024, administration provide a report on potential next steps. Thank you. You've already spoken to it, so yeah. I'll open the floor to questions from council, and then we'll get to the vote here. Councillor Van Newkirk, discussion on the motion. Yeah, and thank you to Councillor Barnhart for the, the comments about as an example, and, and I think maybe it might be just helpful to add those words in there. So I might suggest that um, it says case study one land, comma. I might suggest that in brackets after the word land, counselor, that we say as an example, uh, to, like to really to really hammer home the point that you just made is like, you know, right, tonight we're trying to move something forward. We have one example of land that we don't own, one the land that we do. We don't want to stir up people the, for the land we don't own. So as an example, we're going to direct administration to do some work here. Is that adding those words seem You're okay? Friendly. You're good. Councilor Warner for the friendly. <laughs> Councilor Barnhart agrees. Thank you, Councilor Van Newkirk. Appreciate thank you. that. Thank you, Councilor Barnhart. Appreciate that. Okay. Any further comments, discussion on the motion? Councilor Telebus. You have the floor. Thank you. I, I just, I, I want to touch on it. And the reason I won't be supporting it is just because it has been too on the fly, too much change. Clearly it needed a little more time to consult either individual proposing it or amongst the group because uh, it, it just keeps changing and changing. So for that reason, I'm going to have to vote against it just because I feel it is a very rushed motion. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Appreciate that perspective. <clears throat> Any further discussion? Oh, Councillor Penrod, you have the floor. Thank you, Mayor. Um, a procedural question and then a comment. Procedurally, if this motion is defeated, does that limit Council's ability to bring back a similar motion for a period of time? Madam Clerk. Thank you, Mayor. Through you to Councillor Penrod, that is correct. You would not be able to bring a motion forward. And would for how long? One year. Or until the next election, after the next election. Can you pull the mic a little closer? Councilor Barnard can't hear you. It would be Thank one you. year or until after the next election. 
Thank you. Thank you. Um, so that clarification gives some weight to the vote that's about to happen. But I do recall having a similar situation, and I think it was myself that said to Councillor Nantelenbos, I'm with you on the idea, but I can't follow on the procedure to the idea. I think we got the procedure wrong, so I have to vote against it. So I think that I have to agree with Councillor Natellenbos in this case that I'm not voting, I wouldn't be voting against the idea of what's being proposed here, but it, in order to be consistent in the way that I'm making decisions, I feel like I would have to vote against this motion for the way it was put together tonight. Thank you, Councillor. And Mukov Swain, your hand is up. You have the floor, Councillor Mukov Swain. Yeah, with, with all with all the respect, like th this is exactly what's in potential next steps on page fifteen, right? Um, it it's asking a, a council for direction as a potential next step, and when when I read this report before today, I, I thought this could get there. I understand on the fly, but the, the on the fly I think was just more a protection mechanism to make it to really uh, ensure that residents who are potentially looking at this, don't think that we're going down this uh, this particular path of case 31 as the answer, it, uh, as, as an example. So, you know, respectfully, Councillor Penrata, if you're voting against the motion, you're, you're voting against the motion. Um, the, the process is laid out here in front of us uh, as a potential next step. And I think if we want to advance this affordable housing uh, strategy, which we voted on and which is part of our strategic plan, and this is a is a uh, a measured uh, approach for administration. That they've, they've said this is achievable and doable, um, and I just encourage folks to to vote in favour of it. Uh, otherwise, uh, we do nothing on this for another year, um, and then we're into election, and then we we start that clock uh, one more year plus down the road. I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Seeing anyone else with most motion to speak at this time, I'll ask Council to vote on the motion in front of you. Councillor Munkoff Swain, how do you vote? In favor. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Penrod, I'm looking for your vote. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, that motion is carried 5 2. Uh, Councillors Penrod and Telebus in opposition. Thank you, Council. Now, there was a second motion on the screen, Councillor Barnhart. Are we going to discuss that any further or are we going to move on? You mentioned probably moving on, so. Move on. Thank you very much. All right. That takes care of option six, item 6.1 on our agenda. Item next on our agenda is item 6.2, Beaumont Sport and Recreation Center reduce rate options for first responders and veterans. Ms. Cuthbert, I believe you're presenting this evening, and your microphone is now on for you. Thank you. Good evening, Your Worship and members of council. This evening, I have a report for you on discounted rates for first responders and veterans. During the 2024 budget deliberation, council directed administration to provide information on opportunities to offer discount BSRC rates to first responders and veterans. Currently in Beaumont, our policies allows both Beaumont-based firefighters and RCMP members to access an individual annual adult BSRC membership at no cost. We're also in the final stages of working with Alberta Health Services on a corporate membership program at the BSRC that allows AHS employees a discount at the BSRC. Administration could not find any examples in any other municipalities offering reduced recreation rates for first responders. Administration does not recommend implementing additional BSRC discounts for first responders since there is a current mechanism that allows some of our local first responders to receive, them, uh, receive free annual BSRC membership. For veterans, we did find a few municipalities that do offer discounts to veterans. In Grand Prairie, veterans pay the senior rate. In Edmonton, there is a 10% discount on membership for military members. In Fort Saskatchewan, St. Albert, and Spruce Grove, there is a 15% discount on membership for vet veterans. In Leduc, there is a 20% discount during Veterans Weeks for veterans. The financial impacts of a discounted program would vary depending on the level of discount and the usage. Administration does not have data right now on how many veterans live in Beaumont, so it is difficult to estimate how many people could access such an option. 
Some examples of the potential financial impacts of discounts at various rates have been listed in the report. The impact could vary from 6,000 for a 10% discount to around $30,000 for a 50% discount. That's if it's based on 100 veterans participate in the program. An alternative option could be council could consider directing administration to expand the recreation inclusion program to provide a discount to veterans who apply through the recreation inclusion process. I just wanted to touch that this program does allow $150 credit amount to be applied to a program or service that Beaumont offers. Um, additional funds would be requested through the budget process as this program grows every year. If council chooses to provide veterans a discount rate at BSRC, administration recommends that the discount be for veterans living in Beaumont and the discount is for themselves opposed to family members. This will align with other discounts that we offer. If a new discount for veterans is approved, administration will add this to the appropriate fee schedule uh, and to the fees and charges by law, as well as the city's website. I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Ms. Cuthbert. Appreciate that. Open up to questions from members of council on the report as has just been presented. Councilman Newkirk, you have the floor. Yeah, thanks to administration for the work on this and, and just a few scenarios to just figure out what the scale of a decision this would be, or what scale of a decision this would be if we decided to make it in the future. And I think for me, the in the future part is is where we focus. Um, you know, in the report, it says, you know, basically at budget, when you're reviewing all the fees and charges, if you wanted to make a change, put something forward then, and you have your education piece here. So tonight I'd be willing to move this uh, as in, as information, Mayor. Thank you, Councillor. You read my mind on proceeding on that entirely. So uh, with that, uh, Councillor Newkirk has made the motion that it receives information. Uh, any further discussion on uh, the report or any on the motion itself? Councillor Talibas, you have the floor. I guess just just really quickly in terms of clarity, um, obviously a good report, a lot of, lot of legwork goes into that. So just looking for a little clarity as to what the intention of the report was um, or the request for the report because uh, obviously we see exactly what we asked. I'm just wondering if the intention is down the road to look at a motion or I, I just want to make sure resources are being used properly because um, if we just accept this as information I feel like that's a lot of work that had been put in um, just for a report to be read. So I guess uh, in terms of the uh, counselor that had put that forward do we know who had made this request or was it? I don't recall. Oh, Councilman Newkirk, sorry, I didn't see your light on there. Yeah, thank you. So um, one of the things that um, I try to do is get out there and talk to people and that's where this is coming from. Um, this was a suggestion made by uh, a member of the community and it got some steam with a group. And I said, you know what, that's a novel idea. Let's explore that more. And so that's where the, that's where the work into this comes. And I think that um, there's a, there's a bunch of pieces to consider in here around, uh, you know, if there was a motion, who would you include? Who wouldn't you ask? There's that language in here. Um, you know, would you do 10, 15, 50, or to be in town, or to be out of town. And I think that there's enough information in here that the discussion on this, so should there be a motion come out of this, uh, the fees and charges look that we do at budget time, I think would be the most appropriate spot for that. And that's why I'm thinking if we put it in as information now, then we avoid, you know, clunkiness, um, you know, potentially yet again in your view, um, and and move it to the fees and charges conversation at budget. So um, that also gives some time for the residents who requested this information to consider it a bit too. So, you know, one of the things I was hoping to do is reaching back to a couple of those folks and just say, here's kind of what's in front of us. You know, here's some options. Here's what community, you know, here here's what you know, other communities do. There's five or six examples and just kind of see where it goes. So that's, that was kind of my intent on the information piece tonight. So it sounds good. Thanks for clarifying. Thank you, Councillor and Councilman Nedukirk for the reply and the information around the context. Seeing no further discussion on the motion to adopt the report as information. Council, I'll ask you now to vote on the motion to adopt the report as information. Councilman McCoswain, how do you vote? In favor. Thank you, Councillor. And that carries unanimously. Seven nil in favor. 
of report as information. Thank you, Ms. Cuthbert. Appreciate that. We are at 7.30. We're going to take a break around 7.30. So we'll take a 10 minute recess. When we come back, we'll begin at 6.3 options for winter lighting. Thank you. We are back live after our short break and we will begin our, continue our, pardon me, we'll continue our agenda with item 6.3 options for winter lighting decoration of Centerville Park. And Mr. Lewecki, I believe you're presenting. Your microphone is now on. When you're ready, sir. Thank, Thank you. you, Mayor. Good evening, Mayor and Council. I'm here tonight to present options for holiday lighting and decorations in Centerville Park. The 2023 capital project for Centerville Park included revitalization of the park, including construction of a new plaza, walkways, landscape, a fire feature, and installation of shade structures, furniture, and lighting. The park could potentially serve as a focal point for holiday celebrations and align with the holiday decorations on the light poles on 50th Street and potentially enhance lighten up Beaumont holiday celebrations, as well as align with uh, Winter City's strategy. <coughs> Excuse me. Administration explored four options for decorations and lighting as per Council's direction for this park. Option one was purchase and installation of an artificial tree. Costs associated with this option are $50,000 for a 24 foot tree or $104,000 for a 36 foot tree. And both options have an annual operating cost estimated at $10,000. Advantages include positive visual appeal and impact for holiday season, predictability in tree sourcing versus a real tree, and one-time cost for the tree and the tree would include lighting. Disadvantages include high costs of purchase and potential stabilization issues of securing the tree in the plaza. Option two, purchase and installation of a real tree. Costs could range between $0 and $40,000 plus annually for sourcing the tree plus 2,000 for lighting and 10,000 annually for installation, takedown and disposal of the tree. Advantages include a th authentic look, positive visual appeal and impact for holiday season and possible donation opportunities. Disadvantages include uncertainty and vari variability in sourcing, size and pricing, which would be, be required on an annual basis, potential fire hazard and potentially more difficult to stabilize. Option three, ex light existing trees in Centreville Park. The cost of this option is estimated at $50,000 to supply and install lights, which is a one-time cost with an annual operating impact of $8,000 for power and maintenance. Advantages include that the lighting purchase and install would be a one-time cost until lights need replacing. The ability to use lighting throughout the year for a variety of events, celebrations and holidays and the option is supported by the Recreation and Cultural Advisory Committee. Disadvantages include lack of visual impact versus a tree in the center of the plaza and placements of lights and placement of lights is costly due to tricky installation on tree around overhead utility lines. Option four, replacement lighting on shade structure with color adjustable lights. Cost to complete this option includes a $3,000 one-time cost. Advantages include relatively low cost compared to other options and lights have capability to change colors, allowing celebration of different events, celebrations and holidays. Disadvantage includes that st shade structures already have lights. There is limited additional impact to the park for this option. Options were presented to the Recreation and Cultural Advisory Committee and the consensus was overwhelmingly supportive of option three. At this point, Council may wish to implement an option identified in the report for winter 2024 or include an option for consideration during 2025 budget deliberations or receive the report as information only. That is the that concludes my presentation. Uh, we will take any questions you have at this time. Thank you. Hey, Mr. Lucky, thank you for the presentation and the information in the report. I uh, do appreciate the options. And with that, I'll open up the members of council for discussion on the report as presented. Councillor Barnhart, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Mayor. And thank you to the administration for the, the work on this. 
Um, I'm, I'm really pleased to see that the REC committee has, has weighed in on it and that they have given you an overwhelming support for option three to be further uh, fleshed out and, and figure out what, what we can and can't do. I'd feel more comfortable about option three if I knew a little bit more about two things. One, one is I don't really have a good idea in my head what it is that those trees would look like and whether it's I, I should have driven by just before the meeting to, to get another look at it, but I haven't. Um, and I don't think any of your pictures were specifically of that, were there? Maybe you could put it up again. And, can uh, we put the... Oh, I knew the loca oh, okay, so the location, but the lights, in terms of what the lights would look like, we don't have a, if we, an idea of that. If we could put the picture, yeah. So if you look at the, this is probably the best location. I know it's a little dark, my apologies, it was night. If you look at the left picture, so okay, if you look, in the background there. Those. Oh, okay, so they would have lighting. lights on them. Good, good. Oh, there's a pointer. Look at that. Yeah. So. <laughs> and then, um, Mr. Lewicki, the lights would be also on the, as they are now in that picture. Uh, that that's kind of how you envision it in the future. Uh, through the mayor to Councillor Barnhart. So the light that. This photo is of right now. So the lights that you see in this photo exist right now and would be on tonight if you went to the park. Okay, so the addition of lights on those trees in the back would make it even more beautiful. That's, Correct. that's the intention. Um, and the other question I had was around, oh, oh that's even better up there. Yeah, uh, maybe. Yeah, this is the best. What a difference lighting oh, makes. Eh? Yeah, it's a little lighter, sorry, yeah. My point exactly. And and the uh, sponsorship, um, you, you mentioned that perhaps a group could come forward with um, uh, to sponsor a holiday tree. Is that still possible? I mean, we're not negating that opportunity if that were to happen, if we take this approach. Through the mayor to Councilor Barnhart, we haven't really explored that as an opportunity. Uh, I mean, yes, it's, it's possible that can happen, but we really don't have a means to uh, identify donors or, or sources for trees at this point. If this, if the option for a real tree was selected, then we would have to look into sourcing a tree. That's interesting, and I, I thought about that myself, and I know that it's not something councillors really shouldn't be going around asking for sponsorship for city. That's generally not not looked upon favorably. Uh, yet we do have uh, nurseries locally and nearby. So I again, I didn't know how to proceed with that. If if that were the case, would it have to be someone from outside of the administration would have to make the first move? It's not something we can ask somebody to check on. Maybe the rec committee or somebody from that perspective. Anyway, just a thought. Do you have an answer to that one? Because it, it it has been raised by citizens with me, and and I'm just wondering what's the answer to that question. Uh, through the mayor to Councillor Barnhart, I, I honestly don't really have an answer to how we proceed with how we approach potential donors. I would have to take that back and and look into that further. Or, or it, alternatively, someone comes forward and brings says that they will. And that, then they that's all. But that's also a possibility. If, if someone came yeah. forward and said well, we have a tree, then we would have to look at can we afford it at, Is at it the safe? tree and 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 that's where. In the options we talked about, real trees present some interesting scenarios because their size variations, um, stabilization concerns. There's there's just a lot to consider. Appreciate that, and, and just to speak to, um, I will support option three coming back at budget time. Uh, just to say that it's not only about the celebration for me it's about the winter strategy it's about uh economic development the more attractions we have people come downtown they shop they they visit they they socialize that brings in that neighborly feeling that we we hear from people all the time they want to have a place they want to be proud of of their downtown in Sondraville. so uh i support it coming forward at budget time thank you thank you councillor appreciate that councillor mccook you have the floor Thank you. Um, yeah, I think option three seems kind of like the most logical um, route. I think would would they the lights stay up year round as well, like these do? Through the mayor to councillor McCook, the 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 idea would be that the lights would stay up year round. It would be a one time installation. The lights would stay on the trees. We could choose to light them every evening. We could choose to light them for various. Uh, 
you know, celebration, celebrations uh, for, for city events, so on, uh, that sort of thing. So obviously, if they need maintenance, the reason there's a maintenance cost there is we would need a, a picker truck and, and significant labor. And one of the challenges with, with that option is that there are utility lines close to the trees. And so that significantly increased the cost for installation on, on that option. Okay. Thank you for that clarification. Um, I don't know what the avenue is for this, but I liked, and perhaps you, you already spoke to them, but I think it would be important to potentially hear from our events folks as well before we make a decision moving forward. I think it would be um, good to hear from them kind of what they envision for this space. Are we able to use this space for future events? Um, I would hate to kind of make a decision on one, whether it's a tree or lighting those back trees. And then, you know, later here, oh, it'd be great if we could have done X um, for this event. Um, so if there's any way to be able to kind of have them weigh in or anything like that um, prior to budget time, um, that would just be, I think, beneficial to to have an understanding of that. If, if they envision anything for that square um, and if the lighting kind of you know, we've done Brighton up Beaumont and stuff like that. Do they think that we'll do that maybe in this park in the future or will we maintain it in four seasons? Um, I think some of that um, should be considered in whatever option we look at. And then um, as far as option four, I think, you know, as long as the lights are working and they, they light up nice, I think we should just kind of leave them as is. But that's through, through the mayor to Councillor McCook, th this report was written in collaboration with the recreation team and and their event staff. So, I I think that they they helped develop the options and took it to the committee and so forth. Okay, and did were they kind of more? Did they lean towards any sort of option um, that would be you know kind of most beneficial for some of our events or they? Certain individuals that I talked to uh, did like the option three okay. and okay. were supportive of that as, as it, it allows lighting in the park without, without affecting the functionality of the plaza. Yeah, that makes sense. Perfect. Thank you very much for that clarity. Thank you. For Thank the you, report. Councillor. Councillor Talibus, you have the floor. Perfect. Uh, thank you. <clears throat> I'm uh, just, I guess, a couple questions here. Uh, first one, just looking at the drawing here um, in terms of identifying the location where the lights will go. I think you quickly referenced it, but what's the plan kind of for cord management and, and, and the power supply and making sure that the area is safe, though? Uh, through the mayor to Councillor Natal and Boss, the, the power supply is actually uh, at the base of those trees. So uh, we have a... We, when we did the park rehabilitation, the they put in a meter, and it's it's actually right below the base of those trees. So there would be some requirement for securing the power to the um, the the plug the plug center within the the meter, uh, which would have to be worked out as part of the installation costs. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Um, and I see that uh, the options were proposed to the uh, Rec and Culture Advisory. I'm just wondering if they saw that that photo as well. Um, the only reason I ask, I just feel like it's a small portion of the trees that are within that area. Um, how come we're not looking to do anything on 50th Street there where those trees are located? Through the mayor to councillor to tell him, boss, I wasn't actually, uh, I didn't present it to the the committee. That was uh, Paul Suter. So I, I I don't know what they saw or what was discussed. I just know that, that the outcome was that they preferred option three. I don't believe they would have been presented any options outside of the park. Uh, the motion was specifically relating to decorations and lighting in the park. So they probably were not presented options around further decorations on 50th street or otherwise. Again, I'm presuming that I wasn't there. Fair enough. Thanks. So I guess just for clarity, um, like when we say the park, I, I kind of, 
envision it's encapsulated by all these trees. So I, I just see there could be some some value in, in having it highlighted on our, our main corridor going to and from Beaumont. But uh, I guess it's a, a different question down the road, maybe budget time as to what that would cost. But uh, appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Seeing no further questions or hands up from any members of council to speak, I'll look for a rec I'll look for a motion on the recommendation. I can move myself and anyone else wants to make the motion. Having said that, I'll proceed then. I move that a one pager on option three of the June 25th, 2024 report options for winter lighting decorations for Sontraville Park report be included in the 2025 budget deliberations. I'll no, I see no just speak to it, and most of the comments have made already. So, Council, uh, any discussion on the motion on the recommendation from the report? Seeing no hands up, Council, I'll ask you to vote then, please, on the motion before you. Council Buckoff Swain, how do you vote? In favor. Thank you, Councillor. And that carries unanimously 7 0 in favor of the motion. Thank you, Council. Thank you, Mr. Lewecki, for that presentation. Next on our agenda, <clears throat> pardon me, is item 6.4, Protective Services Council Policies. Mr. Melvin, I believe you're presenting this evening. Oh, sorry, that's on consent, wasn't it? Sorry, I wrote on the wrong one. Sorry, Jay, but you're still on our next second here. So next on our agenda is item 7.1, bylaw 1056-24, Responsible Pet Ownership, bylaw first, second, third reading. It was taken off consent, so we will proceed with a presentation from Mr. Melvin on the report, and then we'll move to first reading followed by second reading with uh, with debate. First reading is for clarification questions, then we'll vote on first reading. Second reading will be for normal debate and voting on second reading. And with unanimous consent of council, we'll move to third reading this evening if that consent is granted by council. Mr. Melvin, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, uh, Chief Melvin, I'll be uh, presenting this evening uh, to council and uh, to the public. Uh, the uh, responsible pet ownership bylaw, as you recall, at the uh, Committee of the Whole on uh, May 12th, um, we did uh, bring forward the uh, draft bylaw uh, and we did make some changes based on our um, discussion that we had um, with the committee, uh, including enhanced definitions for uh, what defines an animal, uh, clarifying what's acceptable su for suitable ventilation and a redesign of the vicious dog signage. Uh, the uh, Those... Um, uh, amendments have been made and it's attached into the uh, PDF attached to this uh, document. Um, as stated uh, at the Committee of the Whole, um, this um, uh, proposed bylaw has been uh, accounted for in the 2024 operating budget. Uh, and uh, if uh, Council proceeds with all three, uh, three readings and the bylaw is approved, uh, we will be updating the city's web, uh, website and social media platforms and uh, for the next uh, several months, we'll be uh, providing that education uh, to the residents of uh, what the upcoming changes uh, are and, um, and uh, any questions that they have when it comes to the responsible pet ownership bylaw. Uh, that concludes my report and I'm open to any questions that council may, uh, may have. Thank you, Chief Melvin or Director Melvin. Any questions uh, for Mr. Melvin before I go to first reading? Councilor Talibus, questions? Thank you. Uh, I guess, uh, Chief Melvin, just uh, for a little bit of clarity here, I know I had asked this in the Committee of the Whole, but just want to reiterate it. There is reference to uh, kind of uh, the birds and, and the bees and, and that concept there, um, but it was made very clear to us that uh, there's no decision to move forward with that concept until another vote comes to the table. So I just want to make that clear because I know we did modify um, some of the, the bylaws in and around um, the hens and, and the bees. So just for clarity, that would come as an action to council to determine if we move ahead with that, correct? Uh, through the mayor to councilor Telemos, correct. That's not covered in the responsible pet ownership bylaw. Um, if it does move forward as part of the land uh, use bylaw update or the urban agriculture plan, uh, it will be brought forward at that time. Perfect, thank you. I appreciate the clarification. Thank you, Councillor. Appreciate that as well, too. Uh, clarifies the floor. So with that, Madam Clerk, would you put first reading on the on the screen? And I will move that bylaw 1056-24, 2024 Responsible Pet Ownership Bylaw, a bylaw to repeal and replace animal control bylaw, be given first reading. Discussion on the motion? 
Seeing none, council, would you please vote on first reading? Councillor Moncal Swain, how do you vote? In favor. Thank you, councillor. That carries unanimously, seven nil in favor of passing first reading. With that, I will move that bylaw 1056-24 be given second reading. Discussion on the motion from members of council. Seeing no discussion on second reading. Okay, council, I'll ask you to move, sorry, to please vote on second reading of the proposed bylaw. Councilman Goff Swain, how do you vote? In favor. Thank you, councilor. It also passes unanimously, seven nil in favor of passing second reading. Uh, as we are looking at doing third reading this evening, uh, we normally now request consensus from members of council, uh, unanimously consent to third reading this evening. So with that, I will move that bylaw 1056-24 be considered for third reading. Discussion on the motion, if there's any discussion. Seeing none. Oh, Councillor Penrod, I apologize. Councillor Penrod, you have the floor. Thank you, Mayor Donalek. I just wanted to say that uh, I did pull the item off the consent agenda and partially just to thank administration for the work they did on this. I see reflected clearly in the updated uh, bylaw the a lot of not a lot all of the feedback that we gave during the committee of the whole uh, and then the additional clarification piece um, that i wanted to make sure happened here tonight has already happened so happy to support uh, and to consider this for third reading tonight thank you councillor i appreciate those comments uh, any, any further discussion on consideration for third reading seeing none council would you please vote on consideration of third reading this evening on the bylaw Council Marco Swain, how do you vote? In favor. Thank you, Council. That also carries unanimously. Seven nil in favor of third reading consideration. And with that, I will move that bylaw 1056-24 be given third reading this evening. With that, Council, I'll ask you to vote on third reading. Council Marco Swain, how do you vote? In favor. Thank you, Council. That also passes unanimously, 7 nil in favor of third reading. The bylaw is passed. Thank you, Chief Melvin, for your assistance this evening on that particular issue. Next, we have on our agenda. Oh, pardon me. I thought I saw a mic go off there. No? Okay. Next, our agenda is item 7.2, bylaw 1055 24, land use bylaw, amending bylaw, first reading. Ms. Raymond, I believe you are presenting this evening. And your microphone is on when you're ready. Thank you. Thank you. If we could just pull up the presentation, please. All right. Good evening, Mayor, Council, and members of the public. My name is Kendra Raymond, Director of Planning and Development. I'm here tonight to present Bylaw 1055-24, Land Use Bylaw Amending Bylaw for first reading. Livable communities don't just happen. They are cultivated through careful planning and dedicated care, making sure every duck is right where it needs to be. This bylaw amendment is a thoughtful tweak to our land use bylaw and is a fine tuning of our neighborhoods to keep our community thriving. This bylaw aligns our regulatory framework with the city's development plans and market trends, preserves affordability by continuing to provide choices for meeting the housing needs of our residents and enhancing the overall quality of life. Since January 2022, administration has been exploring matters related to how additional dwelling units and parking are regulated in the city. Research and engagement can be broken up into two phases. The first phase was undertaken from April to September 2022 by Intelligent Futures and included an online survey, phone and engagement line, internal and external focus groups, project website, and a booth at the Celebrate Spring event that year. This culminated in a report that was presented at the November and December Committee of the Whole meetings, which then resulted in a motion passed by Council in January 2023 to address eight items, which were addressing congestion of street parking and encouraging parking in garages and alleviating street congestion, limiting additional dwelling units, limiting additional dwelling units for front attached garage product to one, limiting additional dwelling units for rear detached garage product to two, and requiring one to be a garage suite disallowing further zero lot line homes, disallowing further tiny homes or mobile homes, adjusting the amount of parking for additional dwelling units to one parking stall per bedroom, and limiting the number of business-related vehicles 
allowed for home-based businesses. ISL undertook evaluation of the eight options, including background research and public engagement, culminating in a report that was provided to council uh, on September 5th, 2023, where council passed a motion directing administration to prepare amendments to the land use bylaw to reduce the number of additional dwelling units allowed on a parcel from three to two, enhancing on-street parking opportunities by requiring driveways to be paired and adjusting zero lot line, or as we will be calling them soon, single side yard development um, uh, developments. So these amendments uh, are in attachment one of the report and they will be discussed in more detail through the presentation. Now I get to have Vanna White over here. So this is gonna be great. Thank you. So the first thing we're gonna talk about is dwelling units. So this table in front of us reflects the current maximum density regulations that are within our land use bylaw. So we are proposing to reduce the number of dwelling units allowed per lot to a maximum of three in the agricultural holdings district, conventional neighborhood district, integrated neighborhood district, and the mature neighborhood district, which are the primarily residential districts within the city. We are gonna be going from four, as we talked about, to three dwelling units per lot. You will notice that there is a key change though in the integrated neighborhood and the mature neighborhood district. And that's because our land use bylaw allows for a broad range of residential uses and varying scales and intensities in both of those districts. So the integrated neighborhood is the one that's primarily in greenfield development right now. So Larev, Elon, those sorts of things. We needed to have a way to still be able to allow for an apartment building to be built while recognizing that a low density um, single family lot, we only wanted to have the three dwelling units on that. So we've tied it back to the area structure plan or the statutory plans that guide that. There's land use concept plans within those plans, which say medium density is going to be here. This is going to be for low density residential. And we will be looking at that when those development plans come in. That is how the minimum density is actually worded in those districts. So this just mirrors that on the maximum side. So just one thing to note, I guess, on the dwelling units is reducing the number of dwelling units allowed on one parcel may potentially reduce new assessment growth revenue generated from these units being added to properties. But there are no current um, properties in the city that have four dwelling units. We are aligning with the market. Only 2% are actually providing that three dwelling units on, on the lots of the 10% that do actually have additional dwelling units. So we feel that the impact of this adjustment uh, to reduce dwelling units is immaterial to the city's budget. I apparently have a different version of this one. Um, okay, so we will be uh, addressing two amendments to address parking, which will be to prevent single side yard or zero lot line front attached product across the street from more single side yard front attached product. And then we are also going to be um, encouraging, we're introducing subdivision standards. So right now the bylaw, because it's a hybrid land use bylaw that deals with the interface between where the public realm stops and your private realm begins, we do have some subdivision standards that are within there. One of those might be block length or the size of your blocks. And then in that we're associating block standards, which is where the driveways are going to be paired there. So um, there's, um, sorry, the block standards are the single side yard one. That was the way we were going to restrict that. And then the driveways, um, I believe, sorry, I must have had an issue when I was uploading this to eScribe because we have actually changed this since we had put this in here. So unfortunately, I should have looked at the agenda carefully before I, something had to be redone, but we are not actually going to be, we don't want to be going forward with uh, the driveways paired with a minimum of 0.61 meters. That was in there to address drainage, uh, but it had since been removed. Um, out of our draft and hopefully it's in yours and I'll need to pull up the council agenda package because um, I think there were actually two presentations in here. So I'm just gonna double check that really quickly. But what we had wanted to do is we are saying where possible driveways will be paired underneath the frontage standards for front garage cars. Um, 
and we're trying to allow for surface drainage. So the 0.61 doesn't actually matter because you can't build that close. So that's why we had removed it after going out to the development community. But um, it is in the council one. Oh, good. I did have issues with eScribe. I try with technology, but sometimes it fails me. <laughs> okay. So those are just some illustrative examples of that. So this is one where, if you can see more clearly on the screen that is above uh, Ms. O'Neill's head, you will see that you've got front attached garage product and it is across the street from a lane product. So essentially that will allow for more on-street parking opportunities. It will allow for more uninterrupted curb frontage to happen there. Uh, same thing with the driveway pairing. So we know that we're hearing that parking is congested, especially in a lot of our new neighborhoods when you're looking at the zero lot line houses and home-based businesses and a lot of other stuff that uh, happens on these streets. And so we're just trying to be able to minimize conflicts. So we'll be looking through the engineering drawings to see where uh, the street furniture conflicts are going to be. So that's why they're in the, the block standards and we will be looking at those to the general design standards. So that's stuff that we'll be looking through through that process to make sure that there are no conflicts. And as I mentioned, there is this housekeeping amendment that we're doing. So instead of it being zero lot line, it's gonna be single side yard. It's confusing. What does zero lot line actually mean? Doesn't mean that you don't have a lot line. It just means that you only have a lot line on one side of your house, no different from a duplex development or a semi-detached. So your house is abutting one side, we're just changing the, the name of it to be a little bit more understandable to the general public about what they're buying into. So the uh, amendment process and next steps would be that we've done this public awareness campaign. We started that May 2nd. Uh, you saw all the billboards out uh, along the city streets saying, you know, um, we're getting our ducks in a row, those sorts of things. Uh, the campaign was, had a lot of really positive engagement. Um, you know, we had a couple of, I think, people who were opposed and actually presented with some positive comments, which was nice. Uh, we've met with the development community there in favor of the reduction in density um, on the lots, and they're aware of the driveways. Um, their biggest change that you will have seen from that report was where are we placing that? Originally, we were talking about putting that on the subdivision plans, but they don't know that information at that time. So we're actually going to be looking for it on the engineering drawings, which is the more appropriate place, because then we actually see they've um, serviced it, where all the lights are going to be, the hydrants, those sorts of things that all reduce where you can park on the road. So tonight we are uh, presented this for first reading. Um, I will ask for a tiny amendment to be made to the bylaw, uh, which we will be bringing back prior to that public hearing. Um, the Tentative uh, public hearing is scheduled for July 23rd, which gives us enough time to advertise because we need to advertise for two weeks in the newspaper beginning July 5th. And then there's a length of time before we're able to bring that back to actually provide for that advertising. So that brings us to July 23rd as that next meeting. I'm happy to take any questions the council might have, but um, on that, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Raymond, appreciate that. So it is first reading, so... Uh... Questions, clarifying questions from council is welcome. Uh, we'll be debating at second reading the various parameters of the of the bylaw as outlined in the presentation. The four units down to three will all be debated at the uh, at the second uh, second reading after the public hearing has concluded. So at this point, open up questions from members of council. I have Councilor McCook followed by Councilor Natalibus. Councilor McCook, you have the floor. Thank you, Mayor. Um, thank you for the work on this. This is obviously, you know, a bit of a process, but oftentimes there's some ripple effects that come with changing a bylaw, and this is why we have to go through such a thorough process. Sorry, that's okay. <laughs> um, so community insight. Um, so good news. Um, there are some people who were, you know, um, had some opposition and came around. Um, were there any comments or anybody who were strongly opposed or had any um, particular feelings about what is proposed? We did receive a couple of uh, emails to the planning inbox regarding the amendment. Uh, it was more thinking that we were adding density than taking it away. So once we were able to clarify that and then direct people back to the myths and facts that were posted on the website, I think that did help people. Uh, but it was only, I think, two emails that we received where it was misinformation um, on what we were doing. 
Great. Thank you on that. And then could you potentially just said, shed some light on the multiple ADUs currently at this moment? Do you know approximately how many we have in the city? Um, the last time we did the count, we were at about 10% of the total housing stock. And I don't have that uh, actual number, but how many units that is okay. that did have additional dwelling units. So most have, uh, if they do have additional dwelling units, they have one and only a few are actually at that two. Um, which would be that 2% that we were talking about. Okay, perfect. Thank you. And then do we have many applications um, in for ADUs in homes that are already built or are they predominantly new homes that are coming on? Most of the applications for secondary suites are in new built homes. It's very difficult to retrofit mm -hmm. an existing home to legally meet the requirements for secondary suites. Mm -hmm. um, so most of them are in new built homes, yes. Okay, perfect, thank you. That's all for now, thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Councillor, appreciate that. Councillor Talibus, you have the floor. Perfect, uh, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> just a, a quick question, I guess, uh, in regards to uh, processes that were potentially considered in amending this uh, bylaw. Just wondering if uh, we talk about parking, if uh, the current, um, measurements of 75 meters squared, one stall per unit um, over that 75 meters squared was was looked at. Um, I know a lot of the concerns that you have raised there talk about parking. <clears throat> and um, I'm just wondering if that was looked at and, and if so, how come that wasn't reassessed to, to reflect the parking concerns? Thank you. Through the mayor to Councillor Natalia Boss, that was looked at through the first, uh, the ISL report that was provided back in 2023 there in the fall. We did not go back and reassess anything that was council directed to coming out of that was those three motions. So we haven't introduced anything new other than the single side yard name change uh, to that. When we had looked at that, um, it was felt that on-site parking is expensive. So it costs between $7,000 to $60,000 more due to land costs and maintenance. And so it isn't the highest and best use of the parcel to be able to provide for that on-street parking. Um, and so that was where um, that report had gone to was that it increased lot costs and therefore it was increasing housing costs. Um, and it was an option that was in there that was um, not determined to want to be pursued by, uh, pursued by council. So. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Bokoff Swain, I see your hand is up, so you have the floor now. Yeah, thanks, uh, Mr. Mayor. I, I wonder if you could pull the presentation back up and go to the first slide uh, titled Background, please. Thank you. Um, so so my, my question is around January 25, 2022. Uh, it, it talks about parking restrictions for business uses and ADUs in residential areas. So what, what I see in this, what's come back for us um, uh, is that the parking restrictions um, for business uses is only included in residential areas. Am, am I correct to assume that we did not do any review or look at parking restrictions in, in commercial areas? Correct, they were in current residential zones. So if, uh, let me phrase it this way, that some concerns around parking, um, particularly for uh, in, in front of, uh, child care establishments on the commercial side of things um, and parking restrictions there. How, how would that discussion, uh, could that discussion be a part of this or um, how would, how would that look uh, in order for, for, for council to, to consider a discussion around that, sure. recognizing that you've done a whole bunch of engagement on uh, and everything else. I, I, I just misunderstood the direction I read that and read that as parking restrictions for business areas, comma, um, and, and to include commercial uh, as well. Um, but clearly I haven't read that right. So is there an opportunity to discuss that, I guess, is, is the question. 
what we had done here was provide the council directed amendments. One of the things that is on count, um, sorry, administration's work plan is to actually look at the land use bylaw and evaluate what's working, what's not working. We know that there are other changes and tweaks we wanted to make, but we didn't want them to get caught up with the council directed amendments. Uh, understanding that council was concerned about density and we are concerned about zero lot line development. So we wanted to be able to get ahead of that record. And I think to your point, that conversation would be had through the what's maybe not working as intended. Um, so there's a number of different other items that we are going to be exploring this year. Um, that is something that will be done entirely in house through staff resources. Um, but that is something we know we need to do. There are concerns with parking in, you know, are these still, um, some of the stuff didn't come out in the community standards bylaw in the way we were first envisioning it to come out in the 2019 land use bylaw. So there's a number of different items. Um, we would solicit feedback on what other items you thought and you had heard through that needed to also be addressed through that as well. And we would examine those. So it would be a commitment we would make. Okay, so thanks for the clarification there. Uh, I guess, could you shed some light on when that process, and apologies if it's in here, I, I, I thought I read through it, but I didn't see a reference to, to that. And so um, when would we be having that um, that broader discussion around the land use bylaw then? I would envision that we'd be having that broader conversation on the land use bylaw um, probably towards the end of this year, we'd be able to bring back a report on kind of where we were going, what direction we had understood and seek um, council's feedback on how to continue to proceed with that. And then we would bring back the amendments probably this time next year. Okay, thanks for the clarification. I, I was, I, I thought we were gonna be doing that as part of this process. And, and I think a few uh, residents, business owners also did. So um, th thanks for clarifying that. Well, what I understand here is the, these are just the, the initial council recommended ones um, and going back a few years, um, but there is still going to be that broader overview look of the bylaw and what I heard is later this year. So I've got um, no, no further questions. Sorry to, to drag that out a bit there, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor. Appreciate that. Seeing no further members of, members of council, pardon me, with any further questions or clarification. On, uh, on the presentation from Mr. Raymond. So at this point, I will ask Madam Clerk to please put the motion for first reading on the screen, please. And I will ask a member of council willing to move first reading or I can do it myself. Oh, Councillor Penrod, you have the floor. Thank you, Mayor Daniluk. I move that bylaw 1055-24, our zoning blueprint, Beaumont land use bylaw, amending bylaw be given first reading. Thank you, Councillor. Discussion on the motion. Seeing none, council, would you please vote on the motion? Oh, pardon me. Councilor Telebus, you have the floor. Perfect, thank you. Um, so I guess uh, just uh, wanting to provide clarity uh, to the public, whether you support this bylaw or not. Um, the next process after this voting would be a uh, public hearing, which would be obviously engaging the public and the community, which is uh, the most important thing. So. Um, again, uh, this is just the process of getting it through the next step so that we can get to the public hearing um, and be able to hear everyone's message, everyone's thoughts on the proposed bylaw and, and be able to react uh, accordingly. So, um, yeah, I just want to make that very clear that uh, whether you support this bylaw or not, this is just the first reading and this is a process we run through to get to the next step. So. Thank you, Councillor. Yes, this bylaw does require public hearing. So after the first reading is is um, passed successfully. There will be a public hearing as part of the process. Thank you. Any further discussion on the motion? Sam, your hand is up. I apologize. That was uh, me saying uh, uh, it was going to be my vote, but I'll wait for you to call it before I yeah, um, position it. Okay, thank you. I, th I assume it's up for just an oversight, no big deal. So having seen that, uh, Council, at this point, I'll ask you to vote on first reading. Councilor Marco Swain, how do you vote? In favor. Thank you, Councilor. That first reading passed unanimously, seven nil in favor of first reading. Thank you, Council. Next on our agenda this evening is uh, eight Councilor inquiries, responses, and reports. Thank you, Mr. Raymond, by the way, for your presentation. 
and discussion on the questions. Councilor inquiries, response and reports. Are there any councilor inquiries or responses or reports this evening? And Buck Swain, sorry, Councilor Buck Swain, your hand is up. Yeah, it's up for the right time this time. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, I just wanted to, to um, uh, let folks know that I do need to leave the meeting. Um, so I apologize, I won't be able to continue further on, including into the closed session. So I just wanted to declare that um, I am out. Um, thank you very much for your time and, and sorry, I was uh, not able to be there in person. Okay, so just to be clear, you won't be part of closed session, correct? You will not be? That is correct, I'm leaving the meeting. Yeah. Appreciate that, Sam. Thanks for tuning in from where you are as part of your work, much appreciated. Um, and are there any further councillor inquiries? Councillor Telebus, your oh, your mic goes on. I'll, I'll, I got her off then. Okay, seeing no and seeing none, move on to our CEO update. CEO Schwartz on vacation. We have our acting CEO, Miss O'Neill, um, in his place. So, Miss O'Neill, you have the floor. Thank your mic you. is on. Thank you, Mayor. Good evening, Council and members of the public. I'm pleased to provide tonight's update on behalf of CAO Schwartz. I have three brief rem uh, reminders for the public, as well as a few departmental updates. The first reminder is regarding playground zones. As the school year winds down, kids will soon be out and about more often, so playground zones have a speed limit of 30 kilometers per hour from 7.30 a.m. to 9 p.m. every day all year round. So please be extra cautious and watch out for increased pedestrians in these areas. Our second reminder is that Canada Day is just a few days away and Canada Day events will take place on Monday, July 1st from 2 to 11 p.m. at Four Seasons Park. There are events for folks of all ages, so please come out and celebrate. Our last reminder for this evening is that property tax payments are due by July 2nd. You can pay at your financial institution online or in person here at City Hall during business hours. On to some updates. Um, following a successful pilot project, the Service Experience Office will now take calls that were going to our public works line. This pilot project provided many learnings that will be applied to the implementation of the full Service Experience Office across the organization. In economic development, we are putting our newly developed marketing plan into practice. The economic development team is meeting with a group of curated site selectors over several events this week. This is another opportunity for uh, Beaumont to promote itself as a destination for all types of development and to continue to build Beaumont's profile in the investment community. And the last updates for this evening are infrastructure related. So we'll have the additional flagpoles um, scheduled for installation at City Hall this week. This project will include the replacement of the original flagpole and new flagpoles will enable the city to display the Alberta and the Beaumont flags while also allowing for temporary display of flags for diversity celebrations and other special events. Uh, next, the construction of the gas fireplace at Centreville Park is also going to happen or begin this week, I should say. And finally, that's too bad Councillor Munkoff Swain has left. I know he's very keen on transit. So we have the May transit numbers to share. Transit ridership continues to grow with the expanded service hours, surpassing our previous May um, numbers in 2019, which were our pre-COVID numbers. So our total ridership increased from 1,966 rides in April to 2,421 one rides in May, which is a 23% increase month over month. So really great. <laughs> it's huge. <laughs> <laughs> and then finally, um, I want to say on behalf of all administration, I want to extend a heartfelt thank you to our Director of Legal and Legislative Services, Sandy Bujaya, for her dedication and co contributions to the city over the past three years. Tonight has, is her last council meeting with us, and I know we are all going to miss her and wish her the very best in her next adventure. So thank you, Sandy. Every day that you were here, you made us better. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. O'Neill. Appreciate that. Any questions on the CEO update? At this point, it'll come back to us in printed form on the next day or so as well. But So on that note, I will, uh, at this time also, uh, thank Ms. Bujaya for her contribution to Beaumont. It's been, has this been three years already? It's been three years. Wow, it's gone by so darn quick. Um, your contribution to our legislative services area has been monumental. 
and you're keeping us on the straight and narrow in terms of our procedures and make sure we're doing things right and keeping me on procedure on point, which is sometimes a challenge. I get that. But uh, I know you're going off to another municipality in a new and expanded role, more responsibility that reflects your experience and your, your long-term career goals. So as we are sore to see you go, we are equally thrilled that you're moving to something that you've been looking to get into a larger role and we're very happy for you. So with that, again, congratulations and we wish you all the best uh, going forward. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. Thank you. Uh, any correspondence, Madam Clerk? None. Yay. Uh, next, notice of the motion. Are there any notice of the motion this evening from members of council? Seeing none. All right. Next, in our next part of our agenda is into closed session. So with that, I'll ask for a motion. I, I can make the motion myself, make it easier. Uh, that council move into closed session at 8.28 p.m., Pursuant to the Freedom of Information Protection and Privacy Act, Section 17, Disclosure Harmful to Personal Privacy. Okay, discussion of the motion, members of council. Seeing none, council, I'll ask you to vote on the motion to move in camera. And that carries unanimously at this point, six nil. In Thank you. We are back live after our closed session. There's no business and motions arriving from that closed session. So with that, I will adjourn our meeting at 9.05 this evening. Thank you all for attending. Enjoy your night. Thank you. We are adjourned.